Well, again, as most of you know, um, I work during the week at a K through 12 school that's here in Davidson, and uh, that is soon to be some kid's alma mater, okay? And you've heard that uh, term, alma mater. I don't know if you know what it means. It means our blessed mother, our, our loved, beloved mom. Um, so, you know, to, uh, to our kids, I was like, hey, this, you know, our school is going to be your mom. Um, and so I told them, they're like, that's weird. I said, yeah, but uh, that's what mater means. It, it means mother in Latin. And so when you think about what an alma mater is, I know no matter where you went to school, we all have the same alma mater. And what I mean by that is it's a university that we all attended. Whether we have uh, a, a community college or we went on just straight to the workforce or you, someone here got a PhD or something like that, we all have the same alma mater. And the place I'm talking about is called the University of Adversity. Okay, we all went there. We're all going to go there. <laughs> we all continually get upper division classes at the University of Adversity. And adversity means basically hardship, right? It's the school of hard knocks. That's what it's known when it's the vocational uh, side of that. The school of hard knocks. You know, I just streetwise, I learned everything the hard way. And when you think about this, part of what our job is as a parent, if you've been one or you get to be one or you've been a mentor in anyone's life, is not to protect them from adversity, although sometimes that's what we think it is, but it's actually to prepare them for adversity. Because one of the things I've often found interesting is our school motto, our vision, our, our, our mission statement actually has something in it that, again, not to put, put it down, but it's, it's actually a little bit contradictory. There's no way it can be both, because this is what it says. It says, a safe and nurturing college preparatory environment. And I think to myself, well, wait a minute, which one is it? Is it college preparatory or is it safe and nurturing? Because I can guarantee you college is not safe or nurturing. I mean, in most cases, nobody's begging you to turn in your paper. Nobody's checking to make sure that you, you know, uh, that your pillow is nice and soft or that your sheets have been recently washed or any of that type of stuff in college. And so part of a safe and nurturing environment, though I'm glad we have it and can provide it, part of it is a preparation for an unsafe, non-nurturing environment, right? The college uh, knowledge that you can get into, that university of adversity that every person is going to go through in life, whether they have a high education or no education, whether they have a, a, a life where everything goes smoothly for them, or maybe things are a little more difficult. And we were doing some searches over there at the school, and we were looking for diplomas. You know, somebody actually has to make those, right? We had to order diplomas for the students. And in the process, I, I kind of started thinking, man, you know, you can order these. This is interesting. And actually, there are websites devoted to, to ordering a diploma from any college you want, any degree that you want. You know, the legit ones won't do that, but there are ones that are out there on the internet that you can say, where, where do you want to go to school? What degree would you like? What, you want cum laude? What, what, what honors would you enjoy? And you can custom order any diploma anywhere. See, I think about this, the, the promises on this website that I saw, and I'm not giving you the link because uh, you know, I don't want anyone to get any ideas, but they said it will be framed and to your door in one week. No study, no waiting. I can be Dr. Scott. I can have a PhD by the next time you see me. I, and you'll have to refer to me as doctor. And I can show you the diploma. And you say, well, wait a minute. No tests? Nope, no tests. No textbooks? Nope. No late night lab sessions? No overnight study crams? None of that? Instant education? The cost was $99. When people want to talk about you know, the rising cost of education, uh, 99 bucks. I could go to Harvard and get a, a, a dual degree from there if I want. You know, special on that. Two for one. What a deal. And you think about that and you say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. If there's one thing I've learned in life, if something sounds too good to be true, it is. See, when you think about this, again, you might be able to print out a piece of paper. You might even get a gold seal on it. 
You might even get someone to forge a signature on that. But does that really substitute for the actual lessons learned in that time? See, I think about it this way, and this is kind of the big thought for today, which is that training takes time. It takes repetition. It takes time, and it takes repetition. It takes somebody like a mom or a dad or a teacher or somebody telling us more than once. You know, again, I don't know if, if Billy has those kind of students. I know he had me a, a few times as a student, so I know at least he had one that wasn't like this. But maybe he has those kind of students that you tell them once and they just got it. I mean, you show them one time and whoo, they got it. They're off and running. But most musicians I know will tell you the same thing. You could print out a piece of paper that says you're a virtuoso, but virtuosos don't happen overnight. They don't actually just grab it the first time. Even the best players have to put in practice and they have to put in hard work in the woodshed, as they call it. And so life lessons, and this is what I wrote down, truths, cannot be bought. They are taught and they are caught. They're going to cost you something. They're going to actually, if you're going to value them, you're not just going to order it on the internet. Right and say, well, there you go, um, shortcut. There are no skills and abilities and experiences that don't take weight and don't take work. There just aren't. And if there's something you learn along the way, there aren't shortcuts. And those are some of the things my mom told me. And I said, well, I'll find them anyway, you know, and I'll find that shortcut. And what do you know? That shortcut cut, didn't it? I mean, there's a lot of times where it really didn't work. And see, even if it was put on a pretty piece of paper, if you were calling yourself a doctor, I wouldn't want you cutting into my body, right? I wouldn't want you working on my vital organs. Oh, oh, you know, wow, Lynn, I didn't know you were a brain surgeon. Yep, printed it out last week. Um, you're actually my first actual patient. And you're like, well, you know, I don't know. I, that doesn't sound good. Did you read anything? Did you actually do any of the, of the lab sessions? No, 99 bucks. Isn't it nice? I got a pretty frame for it, you know, on the, with the non-reflective glass and everything. And you say, well, I don't know. I don't, that's just somehow I want there to be more than that, right? I, you can't buy that. That has to be taught. That has to be tried. That has to be modeled and seen and, and, and go, gone through in so many different ways and, and to actually catch it. Again, if you were a, a dentist, or you said you were, I wouldn't want you just with a pair of pliers and pointing to your paper and saying, oh, I'm sure we'll figure it out along the way. I'd say, I want to know how many of these have you already done? Did it work? Where are the results? Where's somebody's smile that I can talk to who's still smiling after you worked on them, right? Again, that thing on the wall just becomes nothing to me if it doesn't translate into reality. And see, if it's true of the mental and physical skills of life, it's, it's certainly important with the most important of all. And if I could say what life is about on some level, I think it boils down to this. Sometimes it's the simple stuff. It is, what is life about anyway? It's about learning to know God and to trust him. Why did he even bother putting us here for this little vapor? What, you know, my 70 years or 80 years or 90 years or whatever that I get to learn? Was it to, let's see, go to school so I could go to more school so I could get a job so I could send my cool kids to school someday so they could go get a job so they could have some kids and send them to school? And you go, is, is that what this whole thing's about? Well, what it's really all about is coming to know and trust God and to go through the university of adversity. This is what it is. Because in that place, that's where you you're not just buying lessons, but you're, you're, you caught them. God taught them and you caught them and they, they become a part of your soul that you carry on to eternity. I think this is a really important thing. God is teaching us to know him and to trust him. That's what life journey is all about. And that process does not happen overnight. Again, you cannot order it and download it and just say, God, just, just download it. Just, just you know, copy it to my file. How long does it take to learn life's lessons? Life. 
<laughs> That's how long it takes. Um, I'm still learning. I'm probably learning at an accelerated pace at this point in my life because I'm realizing I'm running out of road, right? The lessons that I take with me, uh, ironically, when you're young, sometimes you think, ah, I got time. But now I'm like, man, one of the lessons I'm learning is I don't have time. If I'm going to do something, I better do it now. And so there's no such thing as microwave maturity, right? I can't just put it like a popcorn setting maturity. Okay, right there, 60 seconds and I'm done. Just print out a paper and it says that I have genuine spiritual growth. And so this is the, again, the big lesson if you take it away with you. Truths cannot be bought. They can be taught and caught. And just because it's taught doesn't mean it's caught. See, if the disciples were any indication, and they were, that's one of the reasons we see them in the Bible. That's why they were recorded for us. Their mistakes are there for us to see so that we would understand two things. We don't have to make the same mistakes, but we will. Okay, that's important. You don't have to, but you will. And I think about that as a parent. I'm like, you don't have to make the same dumb mistakes your dad did. You could learn the easy way, but guess what? You won't. Not on everything. There's some stuff you're just going to plain old have to go, what do you know? Dad was right. Hmm. And so if the disciples are a leading indicator, it was this. Training takes time. How much time did they take? Well, they had a really good teacher. I mean, let's face it. Um, Jesus is a great teacher, right? I mean, it's got to be the best, right? <laughs> and he gave them repetition, repetition, repetition. He said it over and over again. Uh, repetition is so important in teaching, right? And in most cases, it takes more, again, than one and done to learn the lessons the Lord's trying to tell us. And I don't know about you, but I consider myself a slow learner. I, I am a person who actually sometimes has to tell somebody, okay, wait, 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 wait. What was the first point again? They're like, there's five things you need to know. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, wait, what was number one? <laughs> Go back to number one. Uh, but here's what's great. I am a good learner. I, I go slow, but once I get it, I get it. And it, it's really, it's soaked in. So when I think about that with God, he, there's things that I just get it at this point. I didn't get it, and it took me many tries to get it, but I think I get it at this point. I caught it. And here's the great news, that God will repeat things until we get it. See, I wrote this down, that the master teaches for mastery of the subject. If you're thinking about some things, again, I think about moms. Um, Lynn homeschooled our kids at, on and off at various times. And I, one of the things I've always admired about her style of teaching is she, she teaches toward mastery. It's not this lesson on this day, and whether you get it or not, we got to follow the lesson plan, turn the page. It's like, but I didn't get it. Turn the page, you know, the grade you got is the grade you get and all that stuff. And I know people who are like that. I'm teaching to teach. I don't teach for mastery. But I, we have some teachers at the school that I really enjoy also that the bottom line is they'll let you try it again. They're like, go back and do corrections, right? These are the 12 you missed. Go back and do, your test is now those 12, because those are the 12 you didn't know. And they go, well, you're making it too easy on it. Well, no, most kids will go, I don't want to do it. I'll just take the grade I get. Who are the people who are disciplined in it? They'll go, I'll take it 15 times if I have to. I am getting this to get it. And by the end of it, those are the subjects that you go, the master is, is seeking mastery. They want to be irrelevant. They want to be the person who's like, you don't need them anymore because you, you got it. You get it. And so God's very willing to wait. And, and you'll see this in Mark chapter 8, okay? We're going to get into it right now, but it's, it's going to be funny to you because if you were paying attention, this is a total deja vu all over again. Keeps happening in Mark. Mark, for being such a small book, very uh, succinct, very to the point, what's funny about it is it has several things that are repeated more than once. Certain ideas that are replicated. So you think, wow, you would think he would only put the most important stuff in here. Why would he put the same kind of miracle twice? Why would he put another one of these lake stories in one of these things where they're crossing the lake? It's like, because this is it. And just because you get it once doesn't mean you've got it because you've been taught it, but have you and I caught it? That's what he's asking here. Mark chapter six was how recently we had a feeding of the multitudes, and here we got another one. Why did he think it was worth the few pages he put for this? 
Well, I think we'll see today they needed another lesson in the exact same point, right? They needed to retake the trust test. That was it. This is one of the biggest of all possible tests in life, which is, are you going to trust God this time? Is it different this time? Well, it's, it, the details are different. See, that's what's interesting about this test. It's the same test. But a few of the questions are different. Have you ever had one of those where you're like, well, I had a kid the other day say, I've already seen this question. I said, did you get it right last time? No. Are you going to get it right this time? I don't know. I'm like, it's the same question. Uh, right? I mean, there's a point where you're like, it's not a different answer. But so often in my life, I'll realize I'm coming up with different answers to the same test that God is giving. And it's like, how many times I got to ask you this question till it's a very obvious answer? And so Mark 8, Jesus feeds the 4,000. In Mark 6, he fed the 5,000. You go, oh, wow, so the test is getting easier? Well, maybe. Similar struggles for the disciples, important lessons on life. And so you look at verse 1 with me. This is what it says, Mark chapter 8. In those days, the multitudes being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus calls it and called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitude. Because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will only fade on the way. For some of them have come from afar. Now, I don't know if you see what just happened here, but the question actually did get a lot easier than it was the first time. Because he tells them his motive right up front. He tells them, I have compassion. Remember what happened last time? They didn't have compassion. They said, get rid of them. And he tells them, if I go with your solution, which I know what it is, which is get rid of them, they will faint along the way. So he is handing them the why not on their reason, right? He's reminding them why their answer was wrong last time and his answer was right last time. And he just kind of gives it to them. Hey, little review, little review, two chapters back. Remember what happened? Remember why I did what I did? And verse 4, the disciples said to him, Ah, we're not worried, Jesus. We remember what you did with the two uh, fish and the five loaves. A couple chapters, man. We got long memories. We, we understand that was in first quarter. We're, we're, we're doing the chapter review. We get it. We've already seen that you meet the needs that are there, and, and I'm sure you've got a plan, so we're not worried at all. Is that what your Bible says in verse 4? Nope. It's not what mine says. This is what it says. The di disciples defaulted to doubt. So can I give you a little lesson from the adversity university that we all go to, that we all go through? Why do we keep going through things? So they'll go through us, right? And this is what it is. Change the default from doubt. And how in the world could my default be doubt at this point in my life? Anyone who's been around our life has seen things that I wouldn't have believed if someone had told me they were going to happen. I still don't believe them sometimes when I'm having them happen. And I just say to myself, man, but then something new comes into my life. And I'm like, man, I doubt if that could work. You go, how is the default still doubt? You know, on a computer, there's a default value, right? This is what God is trying to do in the universe. If I can graduate from the university of adversity, part of it is each time I face something new, I've got to be able to review God's faithfulness. I have to be able to do this to go, well, what did he do last time? Worked it out. Were we high and dry last time? No. Did we drown in the middle of the lake? No. Did <laughs> you just, you start thinking about it. It's like by chapter eight, there's been chapter seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And by the time I get to whatever, you know, I'm a freshman in the University of Adversity, and you go, okay, well, freshmen, they make freshman mistakes. You know, but at some point, if I'm getting to be a senior or a junior or a sophomore, at some level, I've got to be able to face an adversity and say, ha, I've seen this lesson before. You changed a few of the questions. Yes, you put them in a different order. Okay, it's, it's three divided by two instead of three divided by three. I get it, but it's still basic math, right? It's still basic ministry. And when you think about this, the disciples defaulted to doubt, and God was just trying to get them. Can I default you to faith? Can I default you to compassion? They defaulted to judgment, right? Judgment. Get, these, get rid of these people. 
And Jesus is like, could I default you to compassion? Because that's my default. So start there. Start with compassion. Go, hmm, what would compassion do? Rather than what would frustration do? You know, just change the default. And his disciples answered him, how can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? Now, again, it's hard for me to believe if it wasn't such a part of the believer's life. It is. It's just the greatest people of faith I've known have also been people who defaulted to doubt. I've been in the room with them when they went out and preached an amazing lesson to people on trust and then went in and went, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? And you're like, we're going to go through the university, I guess, of adversity. Their automatic attitude was, we're doomed. We're history. There's no hope. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Star Wars movie, but there's two robots, right, in there that for the original, right, the original Star Wars. CPO and R2-D2. C-3PO and r 2 d C-3PO and R2-D2. I'll get it. Yes, there we go. So C-3PO is programmed to panic, right? It's just part of his programming. He just, ah, we're doomed, we're doomed. You know, and no matter what happens, he's just always like, it, it probably won't work. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be sent to the salt mines, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And just no matter what it is, that's, it's like whoever programmed him. And R2-D2 is like the one who goes, just goes rolling into anything with, hey, it'll work out. The fourth will be with us. Now, again, when you think about that, that's the idea that I want to default to kind of an R2-D2 life, if I can. I would like that. What would R2-D2 do? Well, he would roll forward, I guess. And what if, what if they shoot him with something and load him into something? Well, it'll all work out, won't it? It'll all work out somehow, won't it? And if you want to grow to know God, if I do, we have to mature spiritually enough to know that just because it's a new test doesn't mean it's different answers. I, again, that university of adversity. I, I thought about this. Study past test and study past tests. Tests that people passed. See, I look at the, at the scripture, it's full of them. See, I get my own. I can review my own history. This is an important thing to do. Review your own history of the times you thought you were history and you weren't. All the many times you thought, this is probably the last chapter in this sad story, and yet it wasn't. And God's like, whoa, we turned it around there. And you go, wow, that's amazing. So what would make me think he's out of that business now? See, and we make a huge mistake if we treat each new trial, each new level as if it was completely distinct from the past one. I mean, again, if they go, well, this is chapter eight and that was chapter six, so I'm sure everything's changed. No, it hasn't. God never changes. And so changing the default, how do I do it? Again, I think it's remembering and reviewing, remembering and reviewing, and just saying, what, how did doubt work out for you? Well, all the times I've doubted. Um, hmm. Well, it didn't work. And then you go, and how's faith worked out for you? Well, it didn't always go the way I thought it would, but it always went, didn't it? It's amazing. And even the things I went, this is the worst day ever. I was like, no, it wasn't. It was just a, a rough day on the way to the graduation and the incredible things that God has done and put into our life. So the disciples were the very ones who had passed that past test. Remember, they passed out the food. They got the food afterwards and all that stuff. And here they are saying now, well, where would we get water to wash it down? Um, yeah, you did a really cool thing with the, the loaves and fishes, but um, it's like dry. I mean, it, it's hard to eat that stuff. You know? And so they had a new <laughs> twist on it. But I think it's interesting because this was all the way back. This is always going to be the case. Exodus 16.3, the children of Israel said, oh, that we died at the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. We sat by the pots of meat. We ate bread to the full. You brought us out in the wilderness to kill us with hunger. And so what were they doing? They were reviewing their worst fears constantly. Things that didn't even really happen. Review, review. Again, I, I had this incredible breakthrough um, in, in uh, being able to play different things on the drums. I have, I have been owned a set of drums since I was in fourth grade, right? And on and off I've played. But here's what's really interesting about it is there's things that I can do now that I couldn't do then. 
which is funny because my dexterity, my fingers, you know, everything, I'm older now. I mean, my muscles and everything get more sore, my joints and things like that. But I can do things I couldn't do as a kid. Why? Well, part of it is rehearsing the right stuff. See, some people will say, like, practice makes perfect. No, practice makes permanent. It doesn't make perfect. If you practice doing it wrong, you're getting better and better at doing it wrong. So I had this guy tell me this thing in a video where he said, here's what you want to do. You want to break it down, slow it down, so later you can throw it down. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Um, slow it down so you can throw it down. And, and so he said, only practice what you can get exactly right, no matter how slow you have to go. I'm like, this is so slow. But for two minutes, I did it exactly right. And then turn up the beats a little bit. Okay, got it right. Made a mistake. Up, oh, slow it back down. And so what was I doing? I was repeating. I was repeating the right thing. Rather than getting it 80% right and getting practicing 80% right all the time, which means you never get better than 80%. It's just a very simple thought. But I was like, this is it. They were reviewing and rehearsing the wrong stuff. They were reviewing their failures, reviewing their fears, rather than reviewing God's faithfulness. So when I think about this, Jesus says specifically, I have compassion. That was one of their biggest failures. It wasn't that they had the wrong actions always. They had the wrong attitudes. They just didn't have compassion. They didn't lead with that. And it takes a long time to learn that the why you do what you do is what matters most to God because it's why you'll continue doing what you want to do. If you're doing it for recognition, when you don't get recognition, you're not going to do it. When, if you're doing it for results, when you don't get results, you're not going to do it. But if you're doing it out of compassion, well, that's, that's a motive that never goes away because that is something that God has put into your heart. And so when you see Mark 8, 3, Jesus cared about their hunger. And he wanted that to be the real reason that the people were caring for him too. And Jesus said, well, how many loaves do you have? Verse 5. And they said, seven. So they're starting off better than they were before. Did you notice that? The numbers are better. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and broke them and gave them to their disciples to set before them. They set before the multitude and also had a few small fish. Few is more than two. And having blessed them, he said, set them also before them. So they ate and were filled. They took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. This time, it's fewer than it was last time. It was seven, I mean, it was 12 baskets last time. But notice here, it says seven large baskets. So who knows? There was a lot of leftovers either way. Now, those who had eaten were about 4,000. He sent them away. So he does send them away, but he sends them away after he does something for them. And immediately got into the boat with his disciples. And they came to the region of Dalman or the Melita. Um, which is how I pronounce whatever that word is um, in verse 10. So thinking about this, this region, this place, what's going on, just like last time, he first asked the disciples to bring them what they already had. And again, if I could give a, a life's lessons to this, it is this. From the University of Adversity, don't look at the lack. Part of adversity is there will always be a lack. You are either going to lack time or money or both or people or help or something. You're going to have a gap between what you want to accomplish and what you can accomplish given what you have. And so there's, there's a lack, but Jesus didn't say, go focus on the lack. He said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bring whatever you have and look to me for the rest. He didn't provide something out of nothing. Although he could have, right? I mean, we all understand that. He could have, anyone who can bring multitudes of fish out of a few small things could also start with nothing. Right? He didn't need, like, give, you know, a magician, like, okay, give me a dollar and I'll turn it into a suitcase full of money. He didn't need the dollar, right? Everyone understands that. And so you look at this and you go, what, what is it? They needed it. They needed to feel a part of this, this process. But again, it wasn't so that they could go around and say, oh, man, we don't have enough. It was that they were saying, hey, we've got something, which is more than nothing. And nothing is what we thought we had. So he always wants them to start with seeing the snack, not the lack. Right? Okay, we get that. Okay, then the seven loaves, small fish, not enough. But we get that. Don't look at the lack. 
And then verse 11, what's interesting is that Jesus never failed to meet the need of someone who brought him whatever they had. But he did leave a lot of people unfed, unfilled, unfulfilled, unsatisfied with what they were looking for from him. And I think this is a part of the university of adversity too. Because different people learn lessons different way. And some people get a frustration and that becomes the best thing that ever happened to them. Because they go, you know what? I'm going to learn the lessons. I'm going to grow from that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not make the same mistake twi twice. But the Pharisees in the scripture, they were the most learned people, right? They were the most educated people. They had real diplomas, right? Not, not the printed ones for 99 bucks. They were the ones that came from the greatest universities. They were the ones who had all of the power, all of the privilege, all of that. And they didn't learn anything in their life when it came to spiritual growth. They were the same coming in and they were the same going out. Why? Because they were always looking to Jesus for an argument. They thought they already knew it all and they would throw out arguments, but they never, they ask questions to trap him. They never ask questions because they were on a quest for truth. They taught each other all kinds of things, but they never caught the very things they taught. They taught scriptures that talked about hypocrisy all the while being the worst hypocrite in the room, and they never caught it. And so I think about this. Verse 11, the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven, testing him. I mean, you get that, right? Jesus is testing them, but they're testing him. Imagine a student saying, when do we get to test the teacher? And you're like, well, you can. Um, we're going to ask you a trick question. I'm smarter than the professor. And all this, this is what you see here. It says he sighed deeply in his spirit. I don't know if you've ever had one of those. I know you have. If you care about anyone and you care about real learning, and then you see people who don't, aren't getting it, you're, you're, you think, I taught this. Um, if I could buy it for them, I would, but they're just not catching it. This is what he, it says. He, he's like, why does this generation seek a sign? He says, assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And he left them and getting in the boat again, departed to the other side. Now, this is what I wrote down for you to think through, for us to think through together. Jesus is leaving if we want to leave in the leaven, all right? Tongue twister there, but he'll be leaving. He's leaving the scene. He did not stick around for an argument. He had zero interest in that. And a lot of times what I think people pass for like religious learning is the ability to argue with others. I have lost complete interest in arguing with anyone. Sometimes people say like, oh man, we ought to put on an apologetics debate with this and that. And I'm like, I, I am zero interest in ar matching arguments. And we're going to fight over this. And oh yeah, well, what about this archaeology? Oh yeah, well, what about that? You got virtually no interest in that at all. If somebody wants answers, they're out there. If somebody's seeking answers, they're there for the taking. There's always going to be Contrary evidence. You and I both know there's contrary evidence to all kinds of things. There's other perspectives. But the University of Adversity tells me, you know what? Everyone's going to go through it. And this is the only answers that I've ever found anywhere that I've looked in any book of any complexity. The simplicity of saying, God made you. He's got a plan to spend all of eternity with you. He didn't just make you for a short time, but he gave you a short time to come to know him in the middle of an imperfect environment. You're going to come to know a perfect God and there's going to be all kinds of messes and you're going to have to learn to trust him. And if you'll do that, and if you'll believe that he's good even when life isn't and that he's got the answers even when you don't even know the questions, well, then guess what? That's the kind of person he wants to spend eternity with. And you go, got it. Okay, I got it. I get it. I, I, I'm a beggar. I'm I, Like we talked about last week, crumbs falling off the table. I'm just hanging out under the king's table. The master is throwing out amazing thoughts, and I'm catching a few of them, right? <laughs> and, and that's the way I can look at that stuff. Again, there were so many times when I thought I knew everything. The older I get, the less I know. The less I know. 
But I know this. These lessons, I'm going to keep having to learn these same few ones over and over again. And then I graduate. So Jesus, he leaves because there was leaven. Leaven is a picture in the Bible of sin. It's, it's yeast. It's part of their Passover. See, this is what's so interesting. God used all kinds of learning tools throughout the Bible. If you want to understand things pictorially, look in the Old Testament. If you want to understand principles and you're like really into reading legal documents, okay, Book of Romans. It doesn't matter what kind of learner you are. I'm a real more poetic and creative. Okay, you got the Psalms and all of the uh, Proverbs and all of the uh, you know poetic books. And you say, God, God has a lot of different styles of saying the exact same thing over and over and over again. But one of the things that he said was, leaven will ruin the loaf. What is he saying? To puff it up. Pride will puff you up, and it, it, and it actually is just air. That's all it does. Um, yeast injects air into bread. The difference between a flat piece of bread, which is what they would have Passover with, and a big fluffy piece of bread is yeast, right? It's a little yeast packet. And so they, part of their Passover thing as a Jew was every year they had done this since they were kids. Remember, this is the University of Adversity, right? They'd gone through a lot of stuff, and the Jews had a tough time. But they had a whole thing where they rehearsed God's faithfulness out of Egypt. That's what the Passover was. It was things looked bad till they got good, and God was working it all out. And, you know, he had a, he had a way for you to, to go out from the slavery to freedom. And it was just this picture being painted, right? And they would rehearse it every year. And they had to get rid of the leaven in the house. They do it to this day. They had to go through and get rid of all the yeast, and they would have flat bread. And the reason was, it was saying, if you want to get out of slavery and into freedom, you're going to have to get rid of that putrefying thing that actually puffs everything up. You're going to have to get rid of the yeast. That's what it, so he, would, he said, the yeast is the hypocrisy of the, of the Pharisees, by the way. I mean, it, you know, it's great because the teacher gave the answers. It was so funny. I was talking with a high school teacher the other day. I said, what's your review process? He said, I give them the questions and I give them the answers and still they miss it. And I'm like, yep. Yikes. And I'm like, but the, God looks at my life and says, I gave you the questions I gave you the answer, Scott, and still, and this is it. He tells the disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Look at this. It's so funny because they're, they're like, he's talking about, he's mad that we didn't bring lunch. This is so funny. I love it. Verse 14, the disciples had forgotten to take bread. They did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. And Jesus charged them, verse 15, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It's because we don't have bread. So here's Jesus giving them a spiritual, deep thought, uses an analogy that they should be well versed in. And they're like, Did you guys pack a lunch? Oh, man, he's mad. Look, he's mad. And he... he He's telling us don't buy, don't get bread from the Pharisees or, or don't get Herod's um, you know special uh, raisin bread. It's it's poison or something. That's what he's telling us. Conspiracy theory. And he's like, the obvious answer is the obvious answer. And so here in the middle of Mark, notice Jesus had just confronted the Pharisees by saying, "You seek a sign. I'm not giving you a sign." But he gives his disciples a, a sign, a caution sign. He says, be careful of being like them. You want to, you're so impressed with them. Society's so impressed with them because they know so much. He said, they don't know anything. They, their, their knowledge blocks their ability to see the important stuff. And Jesus was speaking spiritually and he says, I will be leaving wherever there's leaven. I won't be sticking around. I'm not going to stay and debate these guys. Obviously he could. You don't think Jesus could have debated the Pharisees so often he did they'd try and trap him and he'd burn them they'd say like well you know should we pay God taxes or not you know should Caesar and he says whose coin is that and he said well it's Caesar's face he says why don't you give to Caesar what's Caesar and give to God what's God's no matter what question they ask him trick question he always beat him but he got tired of that process he's just like there's nothing being learned here 
You guys have no openness, no interest in it. And so Jesus charged them. It's a very stern warning. He says this, learn it well. I will leave any situation where you want to leave in the leaven. If you want to be a hypocrite, I go be one. But I won't be one with you. I'm not going to be hanging around with it. It's, I'm not wasting the little bit of time I have in this life with it. And so this is the thought that he, that he talks about. Again, the Pharisees, the religious sin. This is really amazing because the sin that seemed to bother Jesus the most was religious sin. He could be hanging out at lunch with people who maybe their language was even a little salty, but he could not stand being around people whose language wasn't salty. It's all sweet. But boy, were they nasty inside. He said, I, I'm not going to eat that lunch. No, thank you. And so they all draw a blank over what this is. What do they mean, leaven? Um, man, he's mad. And this is, this is a problem that I've had many times. It's the phrase I'm leaving with you here, and then we're almost done. He says, they reasoned among themselves. See, when I'm teaching myself, I'm never learning anything, right? <laughs> uh, I only know what I know. So they're reasoning among themselves, going, well, well maybe this is the answer. <laughs> well, it was an exchange of ignorance. How many times have I seen that? I, I have been to Bible studies, and I try not to be arrogant. I really do. I try not to be a know-it-all. But there's times where I, I've just said, I can't do it because there's like eight people all offering their opinion on what something means. And I know perfectly well what it means, but I don't want to monopolize the time. So I'm just sitting there going, uh, uh, it's, it's, I'm like, it's an exchange of ignorance. So I'm going to go, well, here's what I think. I think it's like this. And then the person next to me, well, well, I disagree completely because that's what's wrong with the political system. And I'm like, this is not what this means. This is not what Jesus was trying to say. And so this is Jesus being aware of it. He says, why do you reason that you don't have bread? Look at the rapid fire questions. Do you not perceive or understand? Is your heart still hard? Having eyes, don't you see? Having ears, do you not hear? Don't you remember? I mean, like quiz, pop quiz. And, and I think about that. He says, when have I ever had physical be the focus? When have I ever told you guys, hey, why didn't you, why didn't you pack enough supplies? When have I ever talked about that? Why didn't I ever prioritize that? Ever, never in their whole time. And he goes, well, what would make you think I'm talking about now? What makes you think I'm prioritizing it now? And I love this because verse 19, when he says, when I broke the five loaves and the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said to him, 12. Good, they can remember that. Verse 20, also when I broke the seven for the 4,000 just a few minutes ago, how many large baskets of full fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. So they get two questions right on the quiz. And he says, verse 21, how is it you don't understand? <laughs> I love that because the third question they don't really have an answer for. Uh, wait, I got, I got, I got 66%, right? I, I got 12 and seven. Those were pretty easy questions. The how do you not understand is the question that is so hard to answer because it's like, well, because that's a deeper level of understanding, isn't it? It's not just facts remembered. It's faith embraced. The disciples were able to answer the easy questions, but it takes some time to answer the harder ones. And that's kind of the conclusion I wrote here, the university of adversity. We're ready to graduate or go to the next level when we understand that some things just take time to see clearly. This is what you're going to see here. Verse 22 to the end, where we end today. When he came to Bethsaida, they brought a blind man to him, and he begged Jesus to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when Jesus had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And the guy said, yeah, I see men like trees walking. Then Jesus put his hand on the man's eyes again and made him look up, and he was restored and saw everyone clearly and Jesus went away from his house saying neither don't go into the town don't tell anyone else why is he saying this because he whenever they got around the multitudes he didn't get to tell his disciples the stuff that really was going to sustain them after he was gone if he had just come and superficially fed people that Christianity would have died in the first generation I believe why because this the adversity that they were about to go through he had to deepen their understanding and take them from a bunch of selfish people who just didn't even get the easy questions to somebody who could have stayed on the quest even when they didn't have the answers. And I think that's really a big deal. And so 
there's different ways that people have looked at this very interesting miracle. Did you know this is the only miracle in the Bible that I'm aware of, certainly the only one in the New Testament, where it took place in two phases, where Jesus healed a guy, and the guy, he's like, there, are you good? And he's like, mm, sort of. I can kind of see, but it's fuzzy. And he touches him again, and poof, now it's 2020. He's got perfect vision, clearly. And you go like, what was that? What are we supposed to see from that? Well, there's some people who point to a lack of power in Jesus. Like, like he, didn't, he didn't give him enough, you know, he didn't have to dial up enough. You know, I'd, I'd turn it up to seven. How, how about now? How about now? And you're like, no. You know, when you go to the doctor and they put that thing in front of you and they're like, click, 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 what do you see now? And you're like, uh... I don't know. Um, and oh, there we go. Uh, so Jesus is working on his prescription. You know, that's something. I, I can see some humor in that, but I don't believe that's the thing. There's also people who say that the man didn't have enough faith. He had to give him a little bit of faith to heal toward the blurry set. He had blurry faith, but he didn't have clarity faith. And he had to just, and you go, well, that's an interesting application. I think it has zero to do with what the Bible teaches. Okay, so I don't think it's that. What I do think is this. He was deliberately showing his disciples, you know what, miracles, it's a miracle that you can see it all. It's a miracle that there's even a blur on some things in life. I look at it and I go, I realize, man, I have very incomplete understanding of a lot of things, but I can see better than I could. Um, and then Jesus keeps involved in the guy's life. And he doesn't just say, yeah, that's good enough. I'm good. Yeah, blurry's good. Blurry's better. He says, Blurry isn't clarity. I need clarity. I, I'll, I'll stay in the process for clarity. And the guy didn't say, no, I can't see well. I'm mad. I'm suing you. He, he, he accepted the blurry, but he, ex he also explained it, and Jesus touches him again. And I think about this. This is an important thought to me. Insight takes time. It takes repetition. We don't see everything spiritually at once. Could Jesus do it? Of course he could. Is it my lack of faith? No, it's my presence of humanity. It just... Some things take time. They just take time. There's things that I couldn't have understood when I was younger. And so Jesus is so gracious that he'll give me a first touch, second touch, third touch. It's like, is it getting better? Yeah, it's getting better. Things at life sometimes getting worse, but my insight is getting better. <laughs> you know, my sight physically, whoo, it's, it's headed down the other way. You got to get the big Coke bottles. But for my soul... I think there's things that I'm seeing and understanding, and I hope you can say the same that I didn't last year, and I will next year, and I will after that, because I'm in the university of adversity with you. And it wasn't through the easy things that I've learned the hardest and, and best lessons. I didn't learn it the easy way. I, I've learned it the hard way, which is exactly what Jesus said we would do. So we'll, we'll reconvene uh, next week, I hope. Uh, you know, you guys are, are trucking along. Look for lessons in this life, but don't don't be surprised if your alma mater, right, <laughs> your your blessed mom, your it, it sometimes isn't just protecting you from hardship, but preparing you through it and for it, so that you can go to the next level. It's not to say, oh man, everything I ever needed to learn in life, I learned in kindergarten. You go, kind of, except I didn't. I've watched high schoolers uh, be more selfish than kindergartners, and that's when you go, oof, we got to repeat that grade <laughs> over and over and over again, right? So thank you, Lord, for these thoughts. Again, thank you for our moms. Thank you for the ways they were patient with us, um, and thank you for the way that you've been patient with them. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.